As afraid as wild animals often are of uh, people, uh, that fear is often overcome uh, because the lodges have food and the animals uh, often will come out of the uh, jungle uh, in search of it because the jungle, frankly, uh, doesn't have as much food as you would think. Uh, this happens to be a tapir. Uh, it's the largest land animal in South America and it weighs uh, usually uh, a couple of hundred pounds or, or maybe even three or four hundred pounds. Um, and curiously enough, uh, its relatives uh, are not what you might expect. Uh, looking at it, it looks like it might be related to a pig. Or looking at the nose, you might think it's related to an elephant. But in fact, uh, its closest relatives are the rhinoceros and the horse. Uh, now, one of the indicators of that is the toes. Uh, the uh, tapir has three toes. Uh, the uh, rhinoceros also has three toes. And the horse used to have three toes when it was a, a forest animal. Uh, but when it came out on the Great Plains, it lost two of those toes so that it could run a little faster to keep ahead of the uh, predators. In addition, the tapir has a small mane on its neck, uh, and the feces of the tapir look very much like the droppings that a horse might leave behind. Also, if you take a look at the jaw, the jaw is pretty clearly the jaw of a horse. Uh, these tapir are so well domesticated that one of them you can actually touch. Uh, the other one is still a little bit skittish. Their names are Max and Brutus. Oh, and the uh, reason that there is no swimming at the lodge, at least not in the river, is because there are red-bellied piranha there. Uh, uh, most of uh, what I want to see is on land, but the easiest way to get around uh, to any particular location, because the water table is high, is by boat. But once you get to the location, you need to get out on the mud. Uh, this is one of the places in the world where you could uh, catch your death of mud. Twice, while walking through the woods, uh, my guide told me that he thought uh, there was a jaguar nearby, and I asked him why. He said because he heard something and because he saw a flash of brown. But then he admitted it could have been a puma or maybe even a deer. I assured him it was probably a deer. But uh, just uh, that same day, we came across the footprint of a large cat, and a jaguar did appear on the runway across from the lodge. This plant, my guide told me, was a, a cure for the uh, venom of a fur de lance. A fur de lance is basically a rattlesnake without a rattle. And if you're going to be bitten in South America by a venomous snake, it's the fur de lance that probably did it. Digging in the leaf litter, we discover a green striped uh, poison dart frog. Uh, what you do is you pick up this uh, frog uh, with a leaf. Uh, and then you take one of those needles uh, that you see across from it, from a palm tree, and you rub it on the back of the uh, frog, and then you uh, put a little bit of cotton on the end of the uh, uh, needle, and now you have a blow dart for your blow gun. But if you're running an aquarium or something and you want to keep poison dart frogs, uh, they're frankly a little bit too dangerous as long as they have the poison. The way to get rid of the poison is to simply stop feeding them ants. Uh, the poison dart frogs convert the ants uh, formic acid uh, into their poison. Uh, these incidentally are army ants and the ones with white helmets on are the soldiers. Uh, this animal is an agouti, it's a, it is a rodent, and the Dutch at the lodge referred to it as a rabbit without long ears. In addition to the agouti, uh, uh, the forest here contains uh, most of the uh, animals that uh, you would expect to find uh, back in the Amazon, and uh, one of the easier ones to find 
uh, are the monkeys. Uh, there are several different varieties. There are squirrel monkeys, spider monkeys, uh, and howlers. Uh, in this neighborhood, uh, it happens that the howlers are red howlers instead of black howlers. The spider monkeys have the most uh, prehensile of all the tails. Uh, it's virtually a, a fifth hand. Uh, when I was in Africa, one of my uh, guides said that he thought that that was a myth something that you only found in cartoons um, that uh, would have uh, monkeys hanging by their tails because in Africa and Asia the, the tails are not prehensile they just hang down uh, from a branch only New World monkeys know this trick the local crocodilians in South America are primarily caiman a type of uh, alligator actually um, although uh, not a true alligator. Uh, this happens to be a smooth-fronted caiman, uh, which can grow up to about eight feet long. It's considered a dwarf, however. Next, I'm going to show you something that's fairly common in the Amazon, but uh, still quite striking. Uh, it's the morpho, or blue morpho, uh, butterfly. Uh, when its wings are folded, it looks just like a leaf, uh, but when it's in flight, uh, it's very uh, attractive, uh, a very nice colored blue that flutters by. Going through the jungle does require a machete, and in this particular case, the guide has a machete that I gave him. It's, it's my gift to him. Uh, I forget, did I mention to you that it tends to get damp here? Now this is one of those circumstances where you're going to want to um, pay more attention to the audio than to the video. Uh, this bird uh, sound can be heard all throughout the Amazon basin. Uh, but you'll also possibly remember it from various jungle movies. And it doesn't matter where the jungle is, the movie is likely to have this sound from this particular bird, although it's only in the Amazon basin. It's a screaming pia, and this is the best video that I have of it. One of the books that I was uh, reading in order to get ready to go to, uh, to uh, British Guyana was this one, Canoe and Camp Life in British Guyana, 
by Charles Barrington Brown. Now he's writing back in the 1870s, 1880s. And uh, he has some really fascinating stories in here, but there's one in particular that I want to focus on. And it's on the Warracambra Tigers. Now, tigers is one of those words that in South America, they apply to jaguar. And in this book, Charles tells us that those tigers were, uh, the Warracamba tigers, whatever they were, were attacking in large numbers. Now, jaguar are very, very solitary. You very seldom see more than two of them together at a time, and that's only for mating or fighting, as the case may be. But in any case, he has a very interesting account that I want to read to you about these tigers. My attention was attracted by our two dogs, which were tied up, barking furiously, followed by a great stir in the camp. Then some voices proclaimed loudly, The tigers are coming! and one man called to me to come down as quickly as possible to the boats and bring my gun, thinking at the moment that a couple of jaguars had been heard nearby, I seized my gun and made a rush down the slope to the camp, jumping down the low bank, eager to get a shot at one, when to my surprise, I found the beach deserted, where some twenty Indians had been camped. There was not, uh, there was now not even a hammock left. All had suddenly and completely vanished, leaving only two or three smoldering fires in their hammock poles. My men had all taken to the boat and had it afloat with its bow barely grounded in readiness to shove off. They greeted me with cries of, Quick, sir, quick! The Warakamba tigers are coming. There was quite a flutter of relief amongst them when the boat was pushed off into midstream, where they all began to talk excitedly over our escape. The dogs still gave tongue and were even more excited than the men, the hair on their backs standing erect as they sniffed the air in the direction of our camp. I eagerly inquired what were the Warakamba tigers, and was hastily informed that they were small and exceedingly ferocious tigers that hunted in packs and were not frightened by campfires or anything except the barking of dogs. To water, they have a special aversion and will never cross a stream. Uh, which is too wide for them to jump. I ran a little way up the beach along the water's edge with some of the men listening to hear some of our enemies, for up to that time they had been to me both inaudible and invisible. At the same time I believed that some terrible animals were had nearly pounced upon us. Otherwise the Indians would never have acted as they had done. As we stopped, a shrill scream rent the air. Proceeding from the opposite side of the river, not two hundred yards above our camp, and waking up echoes through the forest, died away as suddenly as it rose. This was answered by another cry coming from the depths of the forest, the interval between the two of them being filled by low growls and trumpeting sounds which smote most disagreeably on the ear. Although I knew I was perfectly safe from any attack from these animals, whatever their nature, having the river between us, yet I felt a sort of creeping sensation of horror pass through me at the first shrill cry I heard. Gradually the cries became fainter and fainter, as the band retired from our vicinity, till they utterly died away, seeing nothing of them and only hearing their diabolical screams. I pictured them in my mind as a withering scourge sweeping through the forests. 
walking on to the upper end of the beach, we met one of our Indians coming back who said that he had been the first to land and rim up the beach when he had seen five of the tigers come out of the water's edge and after walking a short distance along it, turned into the forest again. A couple of decades uh, later, there were uh, two uh, people that were uh, down in uh, Guyana that wrote books. Uh, this one uh, by Henry Carrick, uh, 25 years in British uh, Guyana. He was a sheriff down there and uh, a justice of the peace at one time. And he talks about the tigers. And this one uh, by an ethnographer among the Indians of Guyana, Everett F. Imtun. Now, both of these are writing a couple of decades after Charles, and they quote from Charles Barrington Brown's description of the tigers, and they look into it. And what they discover is maybe two or three people, Westerners, had claimed to see the tigers. So there's not a lot of accounts of them. And some of the accounts were clearly uh, fabricated. But a couple of them were pretty solid. Now, some of the speculation is that these tigers were actually a family of Puma, perhaps. Uh, but the general thought nowadays is that they were probably the bush dogs. The bush dogs that make that sound uh, like the Warakambra, the trumpeter bird. M. Tuan writes, uh, one of these three witnesses was my friend McTurk, a man thoroughly acquainted with the forest and its inhabitants, and incapable of telling what he did not believe. He told me that uh, while walking through the forest from the Essequibo to the Cayatua Fall, uh, his Indian companion suddenly became terrified and declared that there were Warakambas uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, sounds were audible, which McTurk thought uh, were those of the Warakamba bird. Uh, shortly afterward, a single tiger, a slim mouse-colored beast, was seen, but nothing else happened. Uh, the same informant uh, told me that he has on several occasions seen the tracks of the pack, which seemed to him to be uh, composed of animals of all sizes, uh, from that of a cat up to that of a full-grown jaguar. Another witness was an Indian on the Pomeroon River, who told me that uh, the pack consists of two large and many small individuals, all gray-colored except for a small mark over the eyes. Uh, the third witness was a Portuguese policeman famous for many expeditions into the interior who assured me that he had met up with a flock of Warakamba tigers and had been obliged to take refuge in a tree from them. But his further account was evidently much exaggerated. 